In today's tutorial, we're going to look at how we generate electricity. The first aim is describe what is meant by electromagnetic induction, then explain how a generator produces an alternating current, and then finally describe how different factors affect electromagnetic induction. The story of how electricity made its way to our homes is fueled by one of the most bitter rivalries in the scientific world, namely the rivalry between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison you may know by name because he's the co-inventor of the light bulb. Other scientists who deserve the same accolade are Joseph Swan and Humphrey Davy. However, their names are seldom remembered. And this highlights one key characteristic about Thomas Edison. He was extremely good at raising the profile of his public image. He's also known for the famous quote, Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Nikola Tesla, on the other hand, was a Serbian super genius. He could speak eight different languages and had the remarkable ability to memorise the intricate shape of complex three-dimensional objects in his head. The upshot of this meant that Tesla seldom wrote things down, it was all stored in his head. And the world inside his head was truly fascinating. You can thank Tesla for the following inventions. Electricity through your plug sockets, spark plugs, fluorescent bulbs, robots and even wireless communication. Yes, Nikola Tesla was light years ahead of his time. You may have seen this device before, it's called a Tesla coil. It uses a form of induction which allows electricity to travel without the need for wires. This is one of the earliest forms of wireless technology, invented in 1891. Sadly, Nikola Tesla does not get the credit for wireless technology because, as I said, he seldom wrote things down, so when he died, a lot of his ideas died with him. But how did the rivalry of these two scientific supergiants start? Well, a young Nikola Tesla actually came to work for Thomas Edison. At the time, Thomas Edison was championing the idea of direct current. If you remember, direct current is when something pushes electrons one way around a circuit. The problem with direct current is the electrons soon run out of energy, so it really restricts how far electricity can be transmitted when using a DC source. This meant that Thomas Edison frequently had to set up DC power stations within the close proximity to each other. This was proving costly. So Nikola Tesla came and shared his idea of alternating current, and Thomas Edison listened and basically gave Nikola Tesla an opportunity to work for him. He said, if you can build a motor for me, an induction motor, I will give you $50,000. Tesla went away and he came back shortly with a fully working induction motor. And Thomas Edison conveniently forgot the terms of their agreement and refused to pay him. Nikola Tesla, as you might imagine, took great offence to this and it started the rivalry. The problem was Nikola Tesla was a difficult man to work out. He was part genius, but some people also believed he was part crazy. He used to believe that aliens were communicating with him. He also made claims that he'd invented a super death ray that military could use to vaporise aeroplanes out the skies. Though the plans for this death ray were never found, but were they stored in his head? We just don't know. But sadly, Nikola Tesla died in 1943 alone in a hotel room, destitute, in other words, completely poor. Some entertained the romantic notion that Tesla died whilst looking out of his window at a light-filled landscape that he was responsible for, but very few people knew it, at the time anyway. So that's a bit of a history lesson. But what is electromagnetic induction and how is it related to an alternating current? Electromagnetic induction is simply when a magnetic field is used to create or induce an electric current in a conducting wire. In other words, a wire that can carry an electric current. In other words, we use magnetism to create an electric current. So here we have a standard bar magnet with the North Pole and South Pole, and we can see the field lines of the magnet. These are responsible for creating the forces of repulsion and attraction that we are familiar with. Field lines always travel from North Pole to South Pole. I certainly haven't drawn them all here, but just a few. Here I've got a conducting wire, a wire filled with electrons that are free to move. Now here's the interesting thing. If I get my magnet and I get the field lines to sweep basically this wire in one direction, the electrons move in the direction of the pole. And when I sweep the other direction, where the south pole leads, the electrons move in the other direction. So I get this movement back and forth. In other words, I'm getting a current in one direction, then the other direction. In other words, I'm getting an alternating current. So by reversing the pole, we reverse the direction of the current. But I was manually moving the magnet. If we can find a way to move the magnet automatically, then we can produce an alternating current generator. The magnet doesn't need to move back and forth. Rather, it can rotate, and this 
causes the different poles, field lines, to cut the wire as well. And when they do, the electrons move one way, then the other way. So you can see south pole moves it this way, and north pole moves the electrons this way, and so on and so on. You can imagine if I sped this rotation up, the electric current would move faster. Getting a magnet to rotate is actually easier than getting it to move back and forth if you want to do it automatically, but we'll come on to that in a bit. What's interesting is if a current moves in one direction, the wire itself produces a magnetic field. Different to a bar magnet, it has a circular pattern, but you can see the magnetic field is working in one direction. Let's assume it's facing north. But when the current reverses direction, the field lines also reverse direction. So this is quite interesting. Because now we can see how a magnetic field produces an electric current in the wire, and an electric current in turn produces a magnetic field itself. This tells us that the electric force, the force of repulsion created by charged electrons, is very intimately related to the magnetic force. You see, we find magnetism quite strange, the way it repels things, it's quite an interesting feeling. But you're probably not aware that you're actually experiencing this all the time. When you think your feet are touching the floor, they are in fact not. They are hovering above it because the electrons in the floor and in your feet are repelling each other. They can't physically touch. This force acts over very, very short distances, so it's impossible to detect, visually speaking. And that repulsive force exerts a pressure on our skin, and our brain tells us we're being touched. So what's the deal with magnetic substances such as iron, nickel, cobalt, and steel? Now we all know that electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom, but what you might not know is they also spin around as they're doing it, like our planet revolves around as it orbits the sun. Now, non-magnets, the spin of each electron is out of phase with the spin of another electron. You can see they're all spinning at different speeds, out of phase with each other. In magnetic materials, the spin occurs in phase. You can see all the electrons are spinning at the same rate and in the same direction at the same time. This causes that force we talked about to act over much greater distances. That's why we feel the repulsive force and attractive force of magnets. So the spin in phase amplifies the force of the electrons. You won't be tested on this, but I just thought it was quite interesting. It might clear up a few things you wondered. The key thing to remember is that the different field lines for each pole of a magnet will cause the electrons to move one way and then the other way. That is electromagnetic induction, when the magnetic field induces a current in a wire. So now we can describe what is meant by electromagnetic induction. So how does Nikola Tesla's AC generator work? Well, this can be set up very simply in a lab. All you need is a conducting wire folded into a coil-like structure, and then the two ends of that wire connected to an ammeter, a device that measures current. Now you can see the dial of that ammeter can change. It can go into the negative and the positive. Remember that negative means that the current is flowing one direction around the wire, and positive means that the current is now flowing in the opposite direction around the wire. That's why it's called an alternating current. So on this graph, we can see that the current is producing a voltage in one direction and the other direction around the wire. So to produce that current, all we have to do is induce one using a magnetic field. So while I'm showing you this, make sure you're paying attention to the dial over here. So what I'm going to do first is just move the magnet into the coil and then stop it in the middle of the coil. Watch what happens. So I move the magnet into the coil and we get a positive movement of the dial. Then I stop it and the dial moves back to zero. This teaches us one very important point. To obtain a continuous current, we need to continually move the magnet. Now watch what happens when we move the magnet out of the coil. The current flows in the other direction. Why is that? Well, when we are moving the magnet in, the north pole field lines were cutting the wire first, and then when we are moving them out, the south pole field lines were cutting the wire first. It was the leading pole. So if you remember, if we reverse the poles, then we reverse the current. So when you put it all together, it looks like this. And so on. So we're getting an alternating current. However, as I said, that forward-back movement is actually quite hard to do. So rotating a magnet is much easier. And we're still doing the same thing. We're getting different pole field lines to cut the wire. And as a result, as the North Pole cuts, we get positive, and South Pole, we get negative, and so on and so on. So that's a really nice, easy way we can produce an alternating current, and that's how generators work. You see, we can use a turbine to rotate that magnet, a giant fan, 
And if we just heat some water and get some steam turning that fan, then we've got an automatic way to turn that magnet and generate an alternating current, as I've shown you. And boy, we thought some wacky ways to turn that fan. We burn coal to turn water into steam. We burn oil. We burn gas. We pour water down a hill. We allow wind to travel over the fan. We use nuclear fuel to heat up water. We use tides and waves. Our human ingenuity never ceases. But also you should be very aware that you don't just need to move the magnet, you can also move the coil itself. You're still doing the same thing, you're still getting the field lines cutting that wire, and when you do that you get your alternating current. Just remember it must continually move and it must be cut alternatively by the North Pole field lines and then the South Pole field lines. We can also use human power to turn such things, such devices. For example, dynamos are fitted onto bikes and when we pedal the wheels we turn a magnet inside the dynamo, or it can be a wire. Remember the magnet doesn't always have to move as I've just shown you. And that can be used to power a bike light. And if you remember in the last section I just showed you that an electric current travelling through a wire produces a magnetic field. Well that magnetic field can be used to repel certain things, such as the light poles of another magnet. It's this repulsion force that drives motors. Motors are responsible for any automatic movement that does this. Now that might not seem like a big deal to you, but if you took this motion away from the world, the world you live in would be massively different. You could say goodbye to cars with their rotating wheels, washing machines, dishwashers, food processors, any sort of fan, and believe it or not, computers as well. So without an alternating current, motors would not have been possible. So you can thank Nikola Tesla for that as well. But remember the most important point, if we rotate those field lines North Pole to South Pole to North Pole to South Pole, near a conducting wire, we produce an alternating current. And that is the basis of an AC generator. So now we can explain how a generator produces an alternating current. So now let's look at factors that affect the size of an induced current and voltage. So let's say this setup produces an electric wave like this. Now we can change certain factors in this system that can lower the current and lower the voltage. As you can see, there's a lower frequency and less waves are fitting onto this trace. And you can see the peak is now lower than this peak. So the peak represents the voltage and the number of waves that are present on the trace represent the current. Similarly, we can increase the voltage, now we have a higher peak, and we can increase the current, a greater frequency of waves, more waves crammed into the same space. But how do we do that? You see, this is one of the most beautiful things about alternating current. You can control the output voltage. Also, because alternating current works with transformers, which will be a different tutorial, we can boost the voltage so electrical power can be transmitted much, much further. This gets around the whole issue that Thomas Edison had, where he kept on having to put up new power stations due to the short range that DC offered. So it's probably easy if I just show you the factors that affect um, a size of induced current and voltage. So in this experiment, I've got an old school ammeter here, and I've got it hooked up to a wire coil. Lots of coils here, you can see. I'm inserting a magnet, and look what happens here. It goes in, and it goes to one direction, then back to zero as I rest the magnet. Now to get it moving back and forth, obviously I need to move magnet in and out, and so you can see positive to negative, positive to negative, alternating current being generated. But how can I change the size? Now I'm trying a bigger magnet, more magnetic field lines, a bigger swing, left and right, left and right. Now I'm just moving wire coil and not the magnet. You can see I'm getting a swing again. And now I'm going to move it faster, and you can see I'm getting a higher current, a more rapid change from left to right. Now I'm trying more coils, and look what a massive effect that has. Massive swing to left and right. So we're getting a bigger induced current and voltage. So this is probably the most important part for your notes, and certainly in terms of exams. Here are the key ways we can change the size of a current and voltage. We can change the strength of a magnet. So the weaker the magnet is, the lower the current and voltage, and the stronger the magnet is, the more field lines there are, the higher the current and the higher the induced voltage. That makes sense, because we've just got a greater force moving those electrons, sweeping them one way than the other. It's a bit like having a brush with a few bristles or a brush with lots of bristles. The one with more bristles will be better at sweeping away dirt. We can change the speed of the moving magnet or wire, as I've said. A slower speed, a slower rotation means a smaller induced current, a smaller induced voltage, and a higher rotation means a greater induced voltage, a greater induced current. As I also showed you, changing the number of coils makes a difference. So the more coils there are, the higher the induced voltage, the higher the induced current. 
And that makes sense because the field lines have an opportunity to sweep more electrons because they're more crammed into the same space. I didn't show you this, but by changing the diameter of the coils, in other words, the bigger the loop is, the greater the induced voltage and current. And that's actually for the same reason as this. We're actually cramming in more electrons because there's more wire for electrons to fit into. So those sweeping field lines will push more electrons in one direction than the other. We can also use an iron core. An iron core basically amplifies the effect. So by inserting an iron core into the wire coil, we create a greater current and a greater induced voltage. So I always link these ideas to the graph. If we lower all these values here, we will induce a lower voltage, as you can see here, and also a lower frequency, so less current, fewer waves fit onto this trace. Whereas this one, we get a higher peak voltage and we are getting more waves, a greater frequency of waves, so the current is greater as well. So that is how we can change the size of the induced voltage and current. But applying this knowledge can be trickier than it sounds. I've seen some pretty wacky examples in exams. I'll just share a couple with you just to give you a bit of flexibility of thought. In one question, they basically detailed a device which was a motorcycle handle and inside that handle was a moving magnet and coil. So we can see how electromagnetic induction can happen here. The question was along the lines of this. If the motorcycle travels on a straight road and then is allowed to travel on a bumpy road, which road will cause this piece of equipment to generate a higher voltage? Well, logically, it should be the bumpy road because it will cause this movement more. As it goes up and down, it will cause this to go up and down and so on. So you'll get a greater current and a greater induced voltage. Another very similar example, you had basically a buoy floating on water and it was attached to very similar equipment, magnet and coil. And it said, right, how could this system produce more energy? Well, if the waves are rougher, they're more choppy, this will move up and down more and you'll get a greater induced current and voltage. So just look out for these scenarios. They will probably throw something new at you again. But the key to understanding is anything that causes a more dramatic motion or a faster motion of the magnet or the coil so that they cross each other more will increase the size of the induced voltage and current. And that's how you describe how different factors affect electromagnetic induction.